um, faithful participants that are really on time. We have a long day and we have a strict program, especially on this session. You notice that there are about 300 people outside for a different meeting and we will need to uh, stick to our time. But uh, sometimes we need to think, to, to think about deeper things and I would like to start this morning with a different uh, kind of proposal. Instead of beginning immediately with our panel, I think that we are comfortable, in spite we are speaking about human rights and religious freedom, we are comfortable in a good hotel, we come by bus to a nice foundation. Some of you will, of course, see the museum today. I invite you to do it during lunchtime. We'll try to keep the time so you have one hour and a half at lunchtime if you want to go to the museum. But um, I, I didn't quite uh, was aware of the um, deep destruction that has uh, come to the people in Iraq and Syria. Uh, we are involved in organizing everything that, uh, that we are doing here. Sometimes we don't watch the news and it was really, really difficult to see the images last night. I was impressed as many of you and I think we should start this morning with a thought for those people and uh, thanking all those that are involved in uh, taking care of their sufferings. Um, we have a representative of uh, such an institution here, João Martins, is the leader, European leader of ADRA. I know that ADRA is already at the, the terrain and uh, our friends from the later day sense, they are also making a lot of efforts and many other institutions that are there. So I would invite you to take just a minute, uh, each one with his own thoughts, reaching to God, reaching to their own heart and mind. We'll just take a minute together reminding them, those people and to ease their suffering. Ezequiel Duarte is the Secretary General of IADLR Portugal. I invite Ezequiel to come here to start the session. I'm sorry to the speakers of this panel. We are going to be very strict this time because of the conditions we have. You don't deserve that, but I, I am sure that you are going to help us to do it. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Paulo. So we are at the session number four, Religious Freedom of Speech and Organization. We will start with Professor Dr. Javier Martinez Torron, Director of the Department of Ecclesiastical Law at the Complutense University of Madrid. He will talk about freedom of expression and freedom of religion, some reflections in the light of the Strasbourg case law. Dr. Martinez, please, the floor is yours. Obrigado e parabéns. Uh, I want them to be the, my, my two first words in this session. Uh, thank you to the Association Internacional por la Defense de la Libertad Religiosa for the kind invitation to be here, and uh, especially to Paulo and Mercedes because they are taking very good care of us. I mean, there is not only, uh, also congratulations because you have um, come up with a very well-organized conference and with much attention to personal details. This warmth is very much appreciated. Um, when, uh, for some reason, when I was preparing this, I understood that I had 20 minutes for my speech. Then, uh, you know, asking uh, for, to a southern Spaniard like me to speak only 20 minutes about something is almost impossible. And, uh, uh, but then I was relieved when I, I, I knew that I had a little more time, but that nevertheless, if I had something prepared for 20 minutes, I will try to be not too long. Um, it's not easy because uh, this is a very complex issue. I mean, we, are, we, we have seen uh, yesterday, and to my fortune, many of the things that I had in mind were already said in the sessions yesterday, especially by Jonatas and by Rosa Maria. Uh, uh, but this, you know, this freedom of expression, freedom of religion, they are two fundamental rights very much in connection. They are supposed in principles to reinforce each other, but uh, let's be true about this. Very often what happens is the opposite. There is a tension between the exercise of these two freedoms by different people in opposite directions. And we have to depart from this reality. And the problem is how to deal with this fact that sometimes people 
express themselves in a way that is perceived by many as offending religious sensibilities, and other times religious people, when expressing their religious doctrines, they are perceived as offending other sensibilities. And that happens not exclusively, but very often these days in the realm of what we broadly could call the realm of sexual morals. Uh, now, uh, what do we do with them? I'm, you know, I'm a jurist, I'm a lawyer, and, um, and I will try to make three, three points and to be as brief as possible in them. Um, any of the things I'm going to say in this morning um, would require many nuances, but I don't have the time to, to enter into those nuances, and you don't want me to have the time to enter into those nuances. But believe me, I, I'm simplifying, by reason of time, a, a matter that as such is very, very complex. Uh, but I think that within this complexity, there we may find some points of reference that is useful to keep always in mind. I, I think that in English they have a similar expression to the one we have in Spanish, that is sometimes uh, we don't see the forest because of the trees. Um, um, sometimes we lose sight of the essential. And one of the essential points, the, the main point, uh, the first point I, I want to begin with is the role of the law in this area. I, I told you, I'm a lawyer, I'm a jurist, and uh, you know, being a jurist, uh, you understand if you have a critical view about yourself, that we lawyers, we have a tendency to overestimate the role of the law in society. This is not the worst part, it's bad enough, but the worst part is the society has bought this idea. And they think that law is just the keystone of everything in society, it's not. Uh, the law is just an important but the limited instrument to prevent or to solve social problems but it's not the key to a healthy social life. It's, a, it's an important part of it. It's an essential part of it. But we, how would I put it? It's, law is mostly about boundaries. Uh, you know, if you have a neighbor, uh, you may live in an isolated place, but most of us, we have neighbors. If you want to have a good relationship, a healthy relationship with your neighbors, boundaries are certainly important. But uh, boundaries do not create a good relationship with your bondage. It's the departure point. They are like the foundations of the house, but you, you have to keep building. And if we want to try to, to face these tensions between freedom of expression and freedom of religion, the legal side of it is important, but it's not certainly enough. Uh, I said uh, law is mostly about boundaries, and that happens certainly in the area of fundamental rights. The basic idea, I would say, is the boundaries exist to prevent harm from one to another. And which is the harm here? When we try to see the two fundamental rights with a tendency sometimes to invade each other's area. Uh, the first boundary that is very clear is, and we, were, uh, we, we learned much about it yesterday, is hate speech is the, I, the problem with hate speeches is with many other legal concepts is the interpretation of them. Um, I, I have the, the impression when people come up with definitions or descriptions of what hate speech is, that it happens to what, uh, I remember when I, I was a student the first year in law, uh, and we were being recommended by our professor of civil law, the textbook that we were going to use. This is the 12th edition of the textbook. The textbook is good, he said, but it happens with textbooks what happens with people. With the passage of time, they tend to gain in volume, and that is not necessarily a good thing. And, uh, and I have this same impression with the definitions we hear about hate speech. When you compare the, the pure lineal definition of hate speech that we, you see in the article 20 of the International Economic and Civil and Political Rights, that's very clear, it's incitation to hatred, violence, discrimination, hostility. Um, it's, 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 it's very clear. Then the courts will come up with the interpretation of that. When you compare it with the 2015 definition of hate speech by ECRI, by the, uh, this commission existing in the Council of Europe against the, uh, to prevent discrimination, to fight against discrimination, 
It's a long list of things that uh, the first side, you, you, you need to read it uh, at least 10 times to understand what he's going to say. If you go to the article f um, 510 of the Spanish criminal code in his current version, it's almost incomprehensible. Everything and anything can come up being hate speech. And that's a very dangerous thing. Uh, hate speech is definitely out of the game in the sense that it's not protected. We all agree about that, uh, although we are perfectly aware of the different view of hate speech in the U.S. tradition. You know, Americans have this thing that they call American exceptionalism, which basically consists in the fact that we do whatever we want and then we call it American exceptionalism and then you don't have anything to say about that. Now, they have a different view of hate speech. Europeans, we have our own versions of uh, hate speech, but nevertheless, we all agree with one nuance or other that it's not a good thing and it is not protected by freedom of expression. Uh, the problem with the overextensive interpretation of hate speech is they may end up becoming a sort of censorship. And we are, yesterday we, we listened to m many interesting things about this uh, so-called cancel culture, the woke culture. Uh, I don't think these, these things deserve the word culture attached to them, but that's the, the, the term we use to describe them. The political correctness, etc. I mean, we all know that uh, what we are witnessing or at least I know that what we are witnessing is a sort of a rebirth of the new forms of inquisition. And uh, we Spaniards, like the Portuguese, we should be perfectly aware that inquisitions are not a good thing to repeat in history. And, uh, and we are witnessing that revival of, uh, you can say that, you can. So hate speech, okay, it's out of the game, but let's be restrictive about what hate speech means. Most often what we encounter is not hate speech properly, but offenses, offensive language against people. And you know, in, I was supposed to say something about the European Court of Human Rights. I'm not going to bore you with a long list of cases and citations, but I, occasionally I may need to, to, to mention some of them. Um, one of the um, early questions in the area of religious freedom that was addressed by the European Court in the early 1990s was precisely the issue of offensive language against religion, a proposal of uh, two, um, it, they, they very important cases, Otto Preminger Institute and Wingrove, there were two cases. One referred to a blasphemous comedy and ridiculizing uh, some of the main characters of Christianity. The other was a sort of cheap, pornographic, uh, lesbian version of the centuries of ecstasy. And uh, in both cases, the, the, the main um, issue, not the only issue, but the main issue was uh, religious feelings are part of the protection offered by Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights or not. When I enjoy the guarantee of my freedom of religion, will I need to be protected for, from language that is offensive to my feelings? And the European Court, which is very good normally in tiptoeing over delicate subjects, we responded with much ambiguity. And uh, more or less insinuating, without making it very clear or very explicit, that it was definitely up to the national jurisdictions. And basically, the national jurisdiction decided that religious feelings had to be protected as part of the religious freedom. They, they were okay with that. And it was not just an old doctrine of the 1990s. In this case, the European Court, as in many others, has been with ups and downs in a sort of erratic way. But uh, hardly three years ago, we, in a case concerning uh, uh, of some offensive statements against the uh, approach that Muhammad took uh, with regard to the third of uh, his wives. There was some more or less a scandal created by a journalist uh, of purpose of the a speech in a small seminar with a uh, right-wing political party. And the court repeated exactly the same, the same statement. So basically, we are in the area in which uh, many people take for granted that if you offend the feelings of someone, the law must intervene. I'm not very much in favor of that. Actually, I'm very much in, 
uh, in opposition to that area. I don't think that law has much to do with feelings. Uh, feelings are subjective, they are changing, they are something that is, they don't belong. As I said it, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, the law is not the, the key to solve everything and anything that happens in society, it's just an instrument has its role and we should stick to that role. For other type of problems or solutions, we have other, we should have other instruments. And I will go back to this at the end of my, my presentation. And uh, well, the problem with feelings is that very often we tend to confuse uh, we live in confusing societies. We tend to confuse feelings with reputation or with yeah. dignity. And they are very different things. In reputation and dignity, the law must take a stand. It's, they are objective things. Your reputation is your position in society. Dignity is your recognition, is your value as a human being. It's not your feelings, what you feel about anything. Uh, it's a different reality. And... Uh, very often the problem with reputation and with dignity when they are harmed in offensive languages is because they are harmed because of lies are told. People lie about things. And that, in that case, the European Court has been very clear, the freedom of expression does not protect the right to tell lies. That sounds nice, we could stop here, but the problem with telling lies is that there are many different ways of telling a lie. The, um, uh, the most usual way that people involved in the media, is, uh, well, but there are lots of fake news, whatever, but uh, we know, I mean, the, the, the world of media is changing so fast, and fake news are part of our new reality. But uh, the most subtle people, they don't tell lies by providing false information, just by providing incomplete information that deform the reality. You, you all know probably the old English story about the blind man in a room and the elephant. And uh, so if you just describe the elephant, it's a, so because you just describe the trump of the elephant, it's a sort of big worm. Okay, yeah, it's true. There, 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 there is that part. But if you forget about the rest. What you are describing is not an elephant, it's a different thing, it's a different reality, and that happens much. Whenever you see the, the information provided in the, uh, in, I would say, in most media about religion, uh, I think that someone mentioned that yesterday, uh, it's, it's mostly about the conflicting, uh, the, the conflicting the, the view of religion, the problems created by religion, that, that, that's true. It is... Uh, uh, religions sometimes create problem, but this is only a very reduced percentage of what religions do in the world. If you just focus on that, you are just deforming reality. Uh, so what can the law do about this incomplete information? I Honestly, I don't think it can do much. I think it's just a matter uh, of the ethical responsibility of, uh, of people involved in the media. But um, there is more or less the idea that as far as you have a minimal uh, factual ground for the, your opinion, and opinions are very subjective, as far as you have some factual ground, the law should be okay with that. Even we know we are manipulating reality, but it's part more or less of the world in we live. And I don't think this is a bad idea, because as I said, law should not try to correct everything. Um, in connection with all this, there is another interesting point which is often forgotten in our discussions about these offensive languages, which is the distinction between attacks on ideas and attacks on people. Offenses against ideas, offenses against people. There is a basic distinction in the law. I mean, it's, a, it's not the same thing to say, um, um, and the Catholic doctrine has remained in a reactionary position when it comes to the sexual and reproductive rights of women. They say, well, uh, uh, that um, Catholics are just a bunch of pedophiles and, uh, and homophobic people that do not belong in contemporary democratic society. It's a very different thing to them. It's not the same thing to say, well, some interpretations of Islam 
are incompatible with the respect of uh, the equality of men and women that to say, well, uh, Muslims are just violent people that try to impose the, their will not only on women, but only on everybody else. Um, therefore, they don't belong in our societies. There are many differences. Uh, they, they are very simplistic examples. But criticism, uh, um, no matter how disrespectful this criticism may be, against ideas, I think it's legally acceptable. Maybe it's not socially or morally acceptable, but it's, it's legally acceptable, and we have to live with that. Attacks on people are a different thing. If you are targeting the people, there is a way of excluding people, though of denying the dignity and the respect that people deserve. That, this distinction in law is important. Again, the problem with that is in our societies, we are not necessarily very sophisticated in the way they think. Uh, this distinction may become very blurred in practice. And what is criticism against ideas may be interpreted as a sort of attack on people, of degrading people. And again, we have to live with this reality, and especially we have to be very aware about the vulnerability of minorities. There is, a, this is always this ongoing discussion about uh, why should we tolerate offensive language against, against the major churches that we wouldn't tolerate against religious minorities. And I say, well, it, it may seem unfair at first sight, but I think there is some common sense in that. Majorities, by definition, are less vulnerable than minorities. It's not that I'm in favor of disrespecting anyone, majority or minority, but certainly if you're in a minority position, your situation in that society is going to be inferior to that of the majority, and we have to be aware of that, and majority should be aware of that reality. Now, I have two other points I will be more brief with regard to, to them. I'm almost in the 20 minutes part of my speech. I'm very good. Uh, which is the, the place and the occasion matters when it comes to offensive language, especially uh, anti-religious offensive language. <laughs> that would require a big explanation, but I'm going to focus on a particular thing, which is places of worship, sacred places. A propos of two cases, uh, more or less recent, one very recent, the other um, uh, three years or four years ago, uh, that involved the first one, the Maria Lekina case against Russia. There was the um, so-called uh, punk rock, I'm not sure what that means, but rock, punk rock performing, uh, again, I'm not sure what performing means these days, but performing, uh, um, uh, singing something with a very offensive lyrics in the middle of the cathedral of St. Savior in, in Moscow. And uh, very offensive against Putin, against the, the, uh, the patriarch of Moscow, etc. And it arrived to the, uh, to the European Court of Human Rights because they, these, um, they, uh, these people received not only an economic penalty but also a prison penalty. Uh, the other case is more recent, which is the Bouton uh, against France, which involves the performance of uh, one of these feminine persons. Um, I'm not sure if I can say feminine women because these days you don't know anymore, but a feminine person that performed a sort of fictitious abortion of Jesus Christ, half naked, in the middle of the Église de la Madeleine, the, the Church of the Madeleine in, in Paris, in France, with two pieces of um, raw meat that were more or less the fetus of Jesus Christ, like the end of... Uh, when it came to the... I'm not going to enter into the details of these uh, judgments, but I want to remark two points that the European Court certainly, in my view, missed. One, when the, there were some references in both cases, well, after all, there was no religious ceremony being held at the time when these performances were made. Only a few people in the church, both in Moscow and in Paris. And I say, why should that matter? I mean, of course, it will be, it matters in the sense it will be even <coughs> worse. But sacred places, by definition, their protection is part of the protection of religious freedom of churches. It, it, irrespective of whether there are people or not, whether there is a religious ceremony or not, that circumstance may be an aggravating circumstance for those performances, but it doesn't make those performances irrelevant from a legal perspective or from the perspective of religious freedom. 
The second thing was, in my view, even worse. It, uh, that especially happened with the Bouton decision. In several times, the European court insists, well, there was a public place. No, a church is not a public place. A church, a place of worship, is a private place that belongs to a certain religious community that normally is open to the public. Not always, because not all religions offer all of the places to the public, as some of you know very well. But uh, normally it's open to the public. Sometimes you pay a ticket, sometimes you don't, depending on what you are going to do there. But uh, you are supposed to enter those places by respecting the rules of the house. It's basic. It's like when you open your, the doors of your house. It's not that my house is open to the public. I may have a, a party for the neighborhood. That doesn't mean that people can do whatever they want to do in, in that. And these, I think, these are important points that the European Court should have assessed more carefully. And the third and last point I want to make in this area is, uh, and I, I link to my first point about the limited role of the law, is the, the um, I would like to underscore the importance of the civil society. Yesterday, Jonathan was talking about the polarized societies we live in, and uh, I think that the way to correct this polarized society, yes, the law has a certain responsibility on it, but the civil society has much more responsibility in correcting this terrible itinerary we are following. And uh, again, we have too much trust in the law, we have too much trust in governments, and we, have, we should have learned something from the pandemic about our trust in governments. And we should try to be more careful about uh, to the significance to, of reviving the role of societal initiative and the role of ethics in society. Uh, again, sometimes you, you can see a tendency in the youth, even in the youth that comes to the law schools, to um, a confusion that we took for granted that had been abandoned centuries ago, the confusion between law and morals. And uh, not everything that is lawful is legitimate or acceptable. Uh, not everything that is illegal it's, uh, it, it is, is necessarily moral. So it's, there are many distinctions that we have been working in, our, in the, the Western legal culture for centuries, but now they certainly seems to have forgotten. So if it's permitted by the law, it should be good. If it's not, it should be bad. And again, this is, this is like giving a carte blanche to the, to the governments to do whatever they want. Uh, I think that the civil society is mostly responsible for creating a culture of respect for people, uh, even if we profoundly disagree with the ideas of those people. Uh, again, I go back to that distinction. One thing is people, a different thing is the opinions or the beliefs of those people. You, you may have heard often this in um, any show in which a celebrity is uh, speaking, I respect every opinion. I, I, every time I listen to that kind of phrase, I think this person must be just a fraud or just an imbecile because nobody can respect every opinion. It means that you don't have any opinion on anything. A serious opinion. An opinion is something that should be not everything, the first thing that comes to you. An opinion is something that you form according to a reflective process, a process, of, a rational process. And then it means that you are going to contradict other opinions of different people, which means some opinions do not deserve any respect. But that does not mean that the people holding those opinions does not, do not de deserve respect. They deserve the same respect you deserve. And this, again, this distinction is essential, but uh, we, we have to create, we have to try to make respect fashionable. Now it seems that the fashionable thing to do is to shout louder than the person you have on um, um, your side uh, in order to impose your, your, your opinion. Uh, and it's, there's much to be done in this area. Um, you know, in, in Spanish, we are very fond of proverbs. We call them refranes. We compile them in huge books. And one of these, very often these um, proverbs are supposed to transmit the wisdom accumulated over the centuries. Sometimes they are just false. 
And uh, one of the um, false uh, refranes, the proverbs, is the one that more or less translates, in Spanish sounds better, but uh, dos no pelean si uno no quiere. Uh, there is no fight if one of the parties does not want to fight. I mean, well, it depends. It depends. That might be true if you have an exit way to avoid the fight. But we live in times we could describe often as a, a domain by a sort of cultural bullying. And the bully does not give you any space. The bully, you only have two alternatives. Either you fight back or you surrender. There is no idea of, well, I don't want to fight. No, you don't have that alternative. And again, the predominant culture that it's imposing itself these days is the, the culture of bullying. And we try to, should try to replace it, uh, fighting back when it's necessary, but trying that in that fight back, we don't adopt the same culture of bullying. And we try to create this culture of respect. How to do that? Well, certainly not necessarily through law, but there are many other means. Education is one of them. Uh, to develop the ethical responsibility of, um, of people involved in the media. Uh, so I, when I was preparing this, I think the, the existence of um, uh, organizations, institutions such as the uh, I, uh, I'm very bad with uh, acronyms, the Association Internacional por la Defensa de la Libertad Religiosa, they are very interesting. You do things, interesting things for mankind. And please keep doing those things and try to spread the, 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 the example. Uh, the language we use, when we, I say we, I say every citizen, but a special responsibility have the politicians. There was the mayor of Madrid, by the way, just uh, uh, visiting the museum this, uh, this very day. Uh, people involved in the media, university professors, uh, uh, religious leaders. This is spreading the example. In, in, in the way we speak about things, about other people, about people we disagree with, about the people we, whose opinion we hate. There is a different way of uh, speaking about them. And then boycotting. Boycotting is a very um, sensible, peaceful way of reconducting things sometimes. And we often forget about things. It works. Uh, it works definitely for some of the big companies that we were using child labor um, some decades ago. Uh, some of them keep doing that. But uh, as far as people, no, I don't want to buy your product. Uh, um, we may act sometimes like, um, for instance, right, I, I always wonder, when people engage in these fights a bit of offensive language, anti-religious language, uh, and they create a scandal of the statement of an insignificant person or an insignificant singer that make a performance that only um, four people have watched. You are just giving free publicity to these people. Therefore, you are encouraging other disrespectful people to act the same because they know I'll get free publicity uh, because the churches are going to bite the, the, the hook. And uh, sometimes the, the best way is silencing people to, to cover this in, 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 a, in, a, in silence. I, uh, you know, in the, I'm fond of football, not what Americans call football, but the real football, what American sorrow called soccer. And uh, that, uh, and you know, the, the FIFA, that has very wrong things normally. The one thing they did good, which is, you know, the pitch invaders, that uh, the people that jump out of the door with a flag or whatever. You know, there's a regulation uh, from FIFA according to which the very moment that the pitch invader goes to the, uh, to the pitch, no TV camera is going to focus on him. So it, it, nobody will know him, nobody will know his face, whatever. That's very discouraging from other people trying to do the same. So you see that even in this area, we can learn something from football players, even from football. And with this, I finish. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Javier. The next presentation is entitled Reconciling Freedom of Religion and Expression Through Faith for Rights. It will be presented by Dr. Ibrahim Salama, Chief of the Human Rights Treaties Branch of United Nations Office of the High Commissioner 
for Human Rights. We'll join him via Zoom, Dr. Michael Wiener, also from the Human Rights Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll spare you the deserved thanks to all who, those who made this event uh, uh, possible today. Uh, and to tell you that I will split my time with Michael Wiener and um, what we will try to do, uh, um, the title of our intervention is uh, Reconciling Religion and Human Rights. And I think it's the elephant in the human rights arena. The, 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 the fact of the tensions between rights themselves, especially with the um, uh, very dynamic landscape of human rights and social movements and technological developments and you name it, all of this creates um, uh, a lot of tension on human rights and the need to consider the universality of human rights as permanent work in progress. You constantly need to reflect and to adapt. And for, for some of the orthodoxy in the human rights arena, this is kind of sinful to think that things need to be reviewed as if uh, this puts in doubt human rights universality. To the contrary, the more you go to the grassroots, the more you are reflective and self-critical, uh, the more uh, you, you enhance human rights universality. So uh, on one hand, the phenomena of tension between rights, I think it's one of the least uh, considered. And on the other hand, a plus forte raison, the tensions between religions and human rights have always been another big, um, uh, unaddressed or unsufficiently addressed issue uh, uh, in the human rights arena. Uh, largely, generally speaking, many uh, perceive human, universal human rights as, as becoming the new universal religion of humanity. And, and this statement, although it means well, deep inside it tries to brush aside the role of religion. Um, I quote Rumi in this respect who said something wonderful. Uh, there are as many uh, uh, paths to God on earth as the breathers of human beings who have ever been created and those who will be created at the end of times. I.e. the path to God and religion is so individual matter that you cannot brush it away. And, and this is the most powerful statement about religious pluralism and, and, and religious freedom and the only absolute right ever, which is the right to freedom uh, of conscience. So uh, doctrinal secularism, and we heard the intervention yesterday uh, about secularism in some states and how it's uh, uh, artificial and simplistic and at times even manipulative. Uh, it didn't resolve the problem, it actually exacerbated the problem. One of the main reasons, in, in, in my view, is that we did not uh, 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 sufficiently consider the issue of tensions between uh, uh, rights and, uh, and religions. Um, I started my career 44 years ago. I graduated early, so I'm not that old, but still. <laughs> so uh, one of the main questions that I kept carrying with me till very recently is, why is it that mistakes are committed despite human intelligence? And um, I, I thought of this with the recent repetition exactly uh, uh, in the same way of the crisis of the cartoons of 20 years ago and the same that happens in Stockholm recently. Why is it that it's unclear? I, I fully agree with the previous speaker that uh, there's no such right as the right not to be offended and that law is not meant to accommodate feelings but to uh, be a tool of social engineering between rights. But, but here comes one of the reasons why people commit mistakes. I think that the law is not a panacea and that unless and until there is a parallel work on the cultural side and on the religious side. Because in society you have numerous value systems and the simplistic idea that law resolves everything uh, have proven to be absolutely wrong. And that's why I admire in uh, Professor Machado's interventions how he uh, always replicates the socio-cultural uh, incidents and real life situations that give meaning to the shortcomings of the law and show the limits uh, 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 of the law. One of the problems of culture and religion in uh, human rights law is that they are perceived as relativism. There is a bad connotation, and the famous paragraph five of the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action that created the Office of the Commissioner in 1993, uh, that speaks about this circular argument that um, um, uh, in human rights work, cultural specificism and religious specificity should be respected, but those cannot justify uh, uh, violating human rights uh, uh, 
uh, that are universal. And in fact, what I fear about in the area of religion and human rights is not uh, uh, defending freedom of religion as such, because I think the issue is far bigger than this. What the faithful rights framework that I will elaborate on uh, uh, in the coming 10 minutes, um, it's, uh, it's an attempt to go beyond freedom of religion as such to see the impact of religion, both positively and negatively, on human rights at large, in their largest spectrum. Uh, what's most dangerous than violating freedom of religion, I would submit, for religion and for rights, is the manipulation of religion either for political purpose by populist politicians or uh, as a tool of conflict uh, by both politicians and by uh, radical uh, uh, religious, religious groups. Uh, why people commit mistake, I remain with the same question. I think we forget, and I think, relating again to what was said yesterday, listening doesn't come naturally. Uh, and I admire what you said, sir, about uh, emotional listening and listening in introspectiveness and in readiness to change one's views. I'm not sure whether we are born with it or this is something that we need to learn. I, I really have no answer. But I doubt that we are born with it because um, greed and, and selfishness is probably uh, uh, an integral part of human nature, so one needs to go against, uh, against it. Uh, and the third element why we commit mistakes is because we forget and because we don't factor culture and religion as most powerful actor and factors in shaping human conscious and human attitude, whether consciously or unconsciously. And that's why limiting to the law is not enough. One needs to really dig deeper into addressing uh, the conscious of people in all its component and its richness. And we are composed of far more than what the uh, prohibitions of the law uh, can provide for. And the third reason why we're committing the same mistakes, I think that we are either preaching to the converted when it comes to the tensions between religions and rights, or to the unconvertible. And we do not involve the most important actors, religious actors themselves. So those are two value systems, like ships passing in the night, that preach the same thing. And talking about preaching, if you put preaching in the religious sphere and advocacy in the human rights sphere, there's something negative in common, which is the idea of top-down. It's somebody who detains the truth, even implicitly, and who wants to convert you to his religion or to advocate for a change in the area of human rights, but from a superiority position. It's because it's human rights, it's sect, it's, it's the secular religion, so you have to follow that. I think one needs more humbleness and more critical thinking in both spheres. And this was exactly the attempt that the Faithful Right framework uh, uh, has, been, has, been, has been trying. Uh, I think we can put on the screen the 18 commitments uh, of uh, human rights. The, I can put the 18 commitments on faithful rights, and, and while uh, Mercedes is kindly helping us to do so, I just want to uh, highlight where we came from and what is this framework stands for. First, it's not an office of the High Commissioner. It's not an exclusive human rights document. To the contrary, if you read the first, uh, the first line of the, it first it's composed of three distinct but related documents. This might be confusing a little bit, but those who are familiar with multilateralism, the different, the use of different terms and the repetition of certain approaches and the mixture of hard law, soft law, uh, and many documents that speak to the same issues is not an easy thing to deal with. But uh, one of the main features of the uh, uh, Faithful Rights Framework, in both its declaration of 2017 and the 18 commitments, which is the operative part, and the toolkit that came two years later, which is the methodological part, uh, the main feature is that it is a document that belongs to the civil society. What we felt and, and were uh, keen to achieve in the Office of the High Commissioner was to translate the first sentence of the UN Charter, we the peoples of the United Nations. And I think it's one of the rare opportunities where uh, groups of individuals and civil society actors came together and attempted what the Special Rapporteur Ahmed Shahid in one of his reports qualified as an emerging soft law. Um, and it was extremely um, um, uh, eye and heart opener, and Nazila was uh, um, leading one of the three groups because there was a group on the declaration and a, and a drafting group on the on the commitments themselves, the 18 commitments, uh, as, as well as a group on the plans of action and the methodology uh, for acting on this by uh, the civil society. Uh, if we can have the second one which explains, so those are the areas 
and, and, and which shows that the faithful rights framework is addressing problems. The problems are uh, commitment one is about conscious, commitment two is about interaction, commitment three is about interpretation of religious texts, uh, as you can see, and commitment four is about secularism, five is about gender, six is about minorities, seven is hatred, eight is monitoring, self-monitoring by religious institutions, nine is the disqualification of, uh, of, of beliefs or the um, takfir, uh, 10 is instrumentalization, 11 is critical thinking, 12 is education, 13 is use, 14 is neutrality uh, in the humanitarian action, 15 is non-coercion, 16 is spirituality, and its role in leveraging, in, in having this um, multiple, multi-pronged approach to human conscious, not only through the law, do and do not, but also the uh, um, cultural, artistic, and spiritual uh, approach to carry the same values in different languages and tones. And then uh, uh, commitment 17 is about research and the importance, and, and this makes that framework an open and a living document. Commitment 18 is IT technological tool in bringing people together without needing to travel and, uh, and, and, and destroy the environment. Uh, and these 18 commitments are 18 issues that the civil society and non-state faith-based actors agreed at this moment in time that they were on top of the agenda. And I said it's an open uh, document and, and, and that's why one of its main features is the need to uh, contextualize it uh, in different cases. By the way, the uh, telegraphic way of, uh, of conveying the, uh, the different uh, 18 commitments in such a telegraphic way was one of the exercises in the toolkit on faithful rights, which was for a group of young people to try to tweet it in 64 uh, letters exactly. And, and this was concretely the, the result of their work. And, and this shows that it's important to let people express themselves and to listen to them. And we found it absolutely capturing the essence of it, and that's why we kept it as part of the, of, of, of the toolkit. So um, uh, if I... First take the presentation of the High Commissioner at that time, Zaid Rad al Hussein in Beirut. What was the key message with which he opened that meeting? I think he, 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 he referred to the necessity of the cross interdisciplinary approach between different systems. And this intersectionality is one of the most complex areas uh, of human rights law. He identified the objective as uh, management of cultural and, and, and religious diversity, not just in terms of tolerating anything, but in terms of respecting uh, all these divergences. Um, and then the, the whole notion is very positive towards unleashing the potential uh, of faith actors and the necessity to uh, um, empower them to um, uh, assume the role as defenders of human rights. Uh, and, 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 and this articulation of the roles and responsibilities was one of the first attempts to build on all of the existing uh, uh, documents. It's an exercise where uh, international uh, um, leaders and, 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 and experts like Adam and Young have been contributing in many different capacities, and that's why it refers to <coughs> initiatives by different organizations and by different uh, 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 authorities. And it remains an, an, an open document, as, uh, as, as I said. Um, the declaration itself had that, uh, what I called the chart of a movement of faithful rights, based on five principles. First, transcending dialogue to concrete actions on interfaith basis. Secondly, uh, avoiding theological traps. It's not a discussion about theology. It's rather about what um, I always call the, 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 uh, the double convergence. What is the common between different faith traditions and how this overlaps with the universal human rights. And that's why you will find that each of the 18 commitments when you uh, um, consult the text has both references to um, human rights law, both hard law and soft law, and at the same time to uh, uh, divine texts that were um, open sources provided by the participants and by no means are exhaustive. Of course, we know that there are many um, uh, religious texts, sacred texts that could be interpreted as restrictive if not violating human rights by our modern standards and that's why this selection was provided by the participants. It doesn't mean that divine texts are positive human rights law, but it means that the underlying underpinning values uh, uh, are shared to the largest extent. The third um, uh, principle is introspectiveness because it's very easy to criticize others and 
very easy also not to see worst criticism in, in what we do. So this commitment of introspectiveness is, is a very important one. And the fourth element is speaking in one voice, i.e. instead of uh, each community or each uh, religious group defending its own rights, uh, here the submission is different. It's unless and until you defend all faith uh, in the largest definition of religion or belief, you're not defending any of them, in fact. Act, you're actually discriminating. So self-centrism and defending one community over the other uh, is, is absolutely uh, against the spirit of the faithful rights approach. Um, and the fifth principle is acting in an independent manner. Um, um, religious institutions are absolutely necessary and important and they have a historical role, but religion is a very individual matter. And um, unless and until individuals and communities perceive themselves as agents of change, uh, we will miss a lot in the potential of uh, this movement. I will uh, limit myself to this to respect the total time and to allow uh, Michael to rather zoom on the issue of the relationship and tensions between freedom of religion and freedom uh, of expression. With your permission, I if we can bring Michael in. Many thanks indeed, Ibrahim, and I hope that you can all hear me well. Yes. Just, okay, thanks for that. And just picking up on Ibrahim's uh, initial rounds on explaining the Faith for Rights framework, um, I wanted to zoom in precisely on the relationship, which, uh, as we heard already from previous speakers, between freedoms of religion and expression, which is oftentimes really seen as, as uh, being contradictory, conflicting, and, and, and really taking rise to, to social problems. Um, and just to give you a, a very concrete recent example, um, obviously with the new chief executive officer of Twitter, Elon Musk, um, and the way hate speech is um, moderated or not uh, on Twitter, um, this triggered also an open letter by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, who last November, so just a couple of months ago, uh, in that open letter said that hate speech has spread like wildfire on social media platforms in countries with starkly different cultural, political and religious contexts with horrific life-threatening consequences for thousands of people. So that's a very concrete example of the problems. And then if we go back a decade ago, uh, the Rabat Plan of Action, which was already mentioned earlier on, and which is also at the core of the Faith for Rights framework. So that's why I wanted to zoom into that. And there it was already analyzed with special rapporteurs, with treaty bodies, with civil society, academics, faith-based actors, that there are essentially two main problems when it comes to hate speech. So one problem is that the real cases of incitement to hatred and violence are not prosecuted. So that's a phenomenon which we unfortunately still see today, uh, really at the global level, that even though a statement has really reached the threshold of Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the perpetrators are not prosecuted, and mainly it is because minorities are targeted, and that's why um, the, the mainstream uh, society doesn't really want to prosecute. And then on the flip side, you have the other problem that, again, members of minorities and others like dissenters are persecuted through the abuse of vague domestic legislation, jurisprudence, and policies against hate speech. So again, something Javier in his earlier presentation uh, alluded to, if you don't have a proper legal definition of what hate speech means at the domestic level, then this is opening the floodgates and it may makes it really easy for authoritarian governments to just label anyone who's criticizing, for example, the government as being a hate preacher or, or whatever. And I'm saying it also because anti-blasphemy laws oftentimes at the national level favor only some religions or are being applied in a discriminatory manner, especially against religious minorities, dissenters, atheists, and non-theists. So that's, again, um, a formulation from Rabat and the Faithful Rights Framework. I'm putting this because it illustrates very practical challenges around freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression, which are oftentimes really juxtaposed and seen as uh, conflicting. However, 
I think we w would need to demonstrate the opposite, meaning that freedoms of religion and expression should and could be reconciled with each other through a holistic human rights-based approach. And I think here again, the Rabat Plan of Action, uh, which was adopted 10 years ago, can be really helpful. Um, and I want to pay special tribute um, to President Jorge Sampaio, who actually precisely 10 years ago, on the 21st of February 2013, when the Rabat Plan of Action was launched in Geneva, and at the time he was the high representative of the Alliance of Civilizations, he welcomed the Rabat Plan of Action and the practical recommendations to states, to the UN system, to political and religious leaders, to civil society and the media. And I also wanted to really quote him by saying that he stressed the need to unlearn intolerance through education, awareness raising, the media and intercultural dialogue in order to tackle the roots of extremism, prevent crisis and deal with them properly including by strengthening the democratic fabric of societies and using the Rabat Plan of Action as a framework for cooperation. And this is, I think, also nicely tying into what uh, Javier was earlier saying, and then also uh, Ibrahim picked it up, that law is not the key to prevent or solve social problems. So the key message is deal with the real cases of incitement to hatred and violence, but only those which are above the threshold of Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And there, the Rabat Plan of Action provides further guidance, because I agree Article 20 is nice and um, short, but then in order to define and really assess on a case-by-case -case basis um, the um, situation, the context, the content, the intent, the extent, and the likelihood of harm, this is precisely what the Rabat Plan of Action provides as an additional guidance and if it is below the threshold, this means that, I mean, the, the, the state shouldn't just sit idle and say, all right, tough luck, this is protected speech, we can't do anything about it. No. There, again, the Rabat Plan of Action provides, and uh, President Sampaio really encouraged that, the toolbox of other um, possible actions, be it in education, peer-to-peer -peer learning, media, also, for example, uh, providing and, and, and uh, supporting mi minority media. I think that's the, or the representation of minority communities in the mainstream media. So I think these are very concrete ways of um, how this can and should be addressed. Let me briefly also, with a view on the time, just give you some examples of where the Rabat Plan of Action and also the Faith for Rights approach and the peer-to-peer -peer learning has been um, applied and, and also appreciated um, at the international, regional, and national levels. So just a bit of more than a year ago, the UN Forum on Minority Issues very specifically encouraged states, the United Nations, international and regional organizations, and civil society to work closely in supporting the positive contributions of faith-based actors including through promoting the Beirut Declaration and Faith for Rights Toolkit. So I think that's, again, a very concrete way of trying to also bring people together, not talk only about each other, but with each other, learn from each other and listening, and then sharing experiences and also to see what works and what doesn't work. And then at the regional level, uh, last May, the Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers issued a recommendation on uh, hate speech, uh, ensuring that human rights education, education for democratic citizenship and media and information literacy are part of the general education curriculum. And then if you look also in the explanatory memorandum of the Council of Europe, uh, which explicitly refers and footnotes the Faith for Rights Framework and Toolkit as a useful tool with its peer-to-peer -peer learning methodology. And then again, uh, Javier alluded to case law at the Strasbourg European Court of Human Rights which also has referred to the six-part threshold tests of the Rabat Plan of Action in several cases. So he already mentioned the Maria Alyoshina uh, versus Russian Federation case, but the Pussy Riot um, case. And then there were also other examples of offending religious feelings and public apology of terrorism. Um, then if you go into the national level, you have also several audiovisual communication authorities uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Morocco, in Tunisia, 
using the threshold test for monitoring uh, incitement to hatred. And I think, again, this is really important because only the real cases of incitement to hatred and violence should be actually addressed and ultimately censored. And if it's below that threshold, there should be the other legal instruments, but not uh, criminalizing it as such. And the last point I wanted to perhaps just zoom in briefly, because it's also a very recent and important um, development at the international level uh, for social media. And there, Meta's oversight board has really issued since 2021, actually since it really started operating, um, uh, content moderation concerning hate speech on Facebook and Instagram, and, and really specifically addressing um, uh, and, and using the six-part threshold test of Rabat, which I think is, is really an important development in that context. So very briefly, um, the, and if you look into several of the decisions um, on the, uh, I mean, sometimes you have two, three pages of the decision itself going through each of the six-part threshold tests um, and and really, like in a in a law exam, uh, applying it and and really looking into um, the specificity specificities of each case. There was one outlying decision where only four of the factors were looked into: context, intent, content, and extent, um, and thereby de-emphasizing the speaker's status and the likelihood of imminent harm. But then, in previous and also in subsequent decisions, the oversight board went back to really looking into each of the six-part uh, threshold test. And there was a recent um, decision uh, just uh, a bit more than a month ago in which in the Iran protest slogan, the Oversight Board also um, really looked into how the protests in July 2022 in the Islamic Republic of Iran um, were in that context not considered a credible threat because, and I quote the, the Oversight Board, the content uh, was found to be unambiguously political and nonviolent in its intent, directly criticizing a government and its leaders of serious human rights violations and drawing attention to the abuse of religion to justify discrimination, unquote. So that's, I think, also a, a very interesting um, uh, quote. And also the board goes into really quoting UN resolutions, conventions, general comments by treaty bodies, and thematic reports, including by former Special Rapporteur Heiner Bielefeld on freedom of religion or belief and equality between men and women. So again, you have this um, uh, oversight board using international hard law norms, ICCPR, CEDAW, and soft law standards, including the Rabat Plan of Action. Um, just very quickly to wrap up, we have also um, on our website not only the threshold test in the six official UN languages, but also in a total of 32 languages, which I think is super important because for content moderators on social media, but also for uh, national media authorities to be able to really use this threshold test in also the local languages is of paramount importance. And just to finalize and to wrap up, there needs to be really a holistic conceptualization and also a re-engineering of interaction between faith and human rights, which is necessary and possible. And here, as Ibrahim was, was explaining, the Faith for Rights framework provides useful guidance and also this methodology through peer-to-peer -peer learning, which ideally needs to be adapted to the different audiences. And final sentence, again quoting Jorge Sampaio, who suggested a combined top-down and bottom-up approach, bottom approach using soft power tools in the fields of education, youth, media, and migration with a view to realizing rights for all on the ground. I hand back to uh, the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael Wiener and Dr. Ibrahim Salama. The final presentation before the remarks will be made by Mr. Francesco Di Lillo from the European Platform Against Religious Intolerance and Discrimination. 
the floor is yours. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear friends, and dear brothers and sisters, I usually don't use this uh, type of salutations in a highly politically charged environment in Brussels, but this is a way to express to you how comfortable I am uh, in this setting this morning. I would like to thank the International Association for the Defense of uh, Religious Liberty for the kind invitation and for bringing us all together. It is a great honor for me to share this space with all of you and the floor with such distinguished panelists. So thank you all for the profound messages that uh, you have shared uh, so far. My name is Francesco Drillo. I live in Brussels with my wife and uh, four children. I represent the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to the European Union institutions. Our office also covers the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, as well as the diplomatic outreach to the missions accredited to the Kingdom of Belgium and to the European Union. Today, however, I'm here as a member of the Board of Coordinators of the European Platform Against Religious Intolerance and Discrimination, or APRID in short. APRID is a network of civil society organizations, including religious and non-religious associations, such as the church I represent, the Association for the Defense of Religious Liberty, the Baha'i International Community, CSW, the Conference of European Churches, the European Evangelical Alliance, Manson Mid and Missy, Middle East Concern, Open Doors International, and KMA. Its mission is to contribute to the collective promotion and protection of the right to freedom of religion and belief in the world as defined by Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Together, we are stronger. And as a platform, we're grateful to have been invited to take part in this conversation. Freedom of religion and belief, together with freedom of expression and freedom of peaceful assembly, stand as three important pillars upon which democratic society is built. These freedoms defend the autonomy of individual conscience, ensure a pluralistic public debate in a free market of ideas, and protect the ability to organize and collectively pursue common interests. These three freedoms are mutually reinforcing. Anytime one of them is strengthened or weakened, the other two are likewise affected. This relationship is seen clearly in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, I know that many of you will know it by heart, but I consider it so beautiful and profound that it's worth to me uh, quoting it. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom, either alone or in community, with others and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in practice, uh, in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. So as shown in this declaration, the right to freedom of religion or belief fundamentally relies on the freedom of expression and the freedom of assembly as means by which faith and religion are expressed in the lives of individuals, making it inseparable from these other important freedoms. As APRID, we affirm that the state of freedom of religion or belief in a country acts as an important litmus test of pluralism and the space available for critical dialogue. When a state allows uh, religious dissent, most likely it will allow other forms of dissent. Conversely, states which restrict and disrespect religious expression may as well disrespect other forms of minority opinion or expressions, weakening human rights as a whole. In its cross-regional joint statement on freedom of religion or belief delivered at the 77th session of the United Nations General Assembly Third Committee last October, the European Union pointed out that, that the violation of freedom of religion or belief exacerbates intolerance and in some settings may constitute early indicators of potential violence, conflicts, and wider persecution. Freedom of religion or belief is not a privilege for some religious groups at the fringes or even for those who belong to organized or well-established or majority religions. It is a precious human right for all of us. Freedom of religion belief is an individual right, and as Dr. Ganon Diop said yesterday so beautifully, it's an expression of the immeasurable value of every human being. All humans are free to choose and manifest any religion or philosophy of life without coercion, neither from society nor from government. Freedom of religion belief protects theistic, non-theistic, and atheistic beliefs alike. It ensures 
both the right to participate in public or private form of religious worships, but also the right to abstain from any of it. Freedom of religious belief is a freedom of conscience which affirms the universal human impulse to search for meaning in life and protects the right of all individuals to live according to their beliefs regarding life's purpose. Commenting on the vital role of religion and belief in creating unity among all members of the European society, first, first Vice President of the European Commission, Franz Timmermans, said back in 2016, religious leaders play a pivotal role to spur the integration and participation of all their members in Europe as full Europeans, no matter the place of their cradle, no matter their creed. Through these dialogues, we identify those common fundamental values that bind us instead of harping on the issues that divide us. And I like the stress here on, again, dialogue. Freedom of religion belief does not mean that religions or philosophies as a whole or individual adherence should be, sh should be shielded from criticism. That would be contrary to the principle of freedom of expression. Likewise, society and government should not be shielded from criticism from religions uh, from religions or philosophies. A frank and critical dialogue on what country and what society we want to live in is an important element of a healthy democratic process. Among some circles, there is a growing view of the important separation of church and state as an absolute separation from anything religious and anything political. And this view discourages the role of religions, uh, religious values in informing public morality and debate including legislative actions that are taken as a result of this debate. The inclusion, we believe that the inclusion of all lawful voices in the public square, including religious voices, should be protected in order to maintain the values of pluralism, which are essential to a democratic process. Religion and belief have played a crucial role in building the moral and cultural foundations up upon which societies are built. The Beirut Declaration proclaims that religious, ethical, and philosophical texts preceded international law in upholding the oneness of humankind, the sacredness of the right to life, and the corresponding individual and collective duties that are grounded in the hearts of believers. Likely, the European Union treaties contemplate such space with the, fra within, uh, with the framework created by the Article 17 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union which sets the dialogue with churches, religious associations or communities, philosophical and non-confessional organizations. While its implementation and its mechanism can be definitely improved, it still offers a valuable format for constructive dialogue and engagement. Those hybrid members who represent churches and religious communities and organizations have had the experience within this framework. As first vice president of the European Parliament, Otmar Karas said, if the European project is to answer the challenges ahead, it must remain grounded in reality, close to EU citizens and their everyday lives. Churches, faith, and philosophical organizations, in all their diversity, he concluded, are very much part of everyday reality for many of our citizens. In setting forward the Faithful Rights Framework, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights stated, Individual and communal expression of religions or beliefs thrive and flourish in environments where human rights are protected. Similarly, human rights can benefit from deeply rooted ethical and spiritual foundations provided by religions or beliefs. Dr. Brian Grimm go goes even far as claiming that freedom of religion or belief is not an outcome of civil society, but rather a causal factor for its creation and continuation. It reinforces all aspects of human rights and benefits from other civil liberties. It is an integral part of a free and peaceful society. It contributes to a rich variety of societal benefits correlating to lower rates of armed conflict, better health overall, and higher incomes. Due to the symbiotic nature of religious freedom and the proliferation of human rights, it should be considered part and parcel of the whole human rights framework and therefore should be an integrated element of all human rights dialogues, consultations, and uh, trade agreements. It is not a standalone right. It is part of a system of related rights which collectively protect human dignity, excluding freedom of religion or belief from human rights dialogues and international cooperation inherently undermines the other human rights that we sought after. 
It places limits on how far other freedoms, such as freedom of expression or freedom of assembly, extend into civil society. As Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints explained, the freedom to express beliefs about God, which took centuries of struggle to establish, also supports the right to express opinions about morality, society, politics, literature, art, science, or virtually any other subject. The hard-won religious rights to peaceful assemble for worship or to print religious literature also support the rights to assemble for political, social, cultural, and familiar reasons or to print books or newspapers addressing a host of subjects. Protection of religious freedom creates a cascade of human rights protecting citizens' rights to expression, conscience, and peaceful assembly. I suppose that by now it is clear that to me and to my fellow APRID members, freedom of religion belief is an important and far-reaching part of the international human rights framework. I would like to shift the focus now on Europe and some of the tools civil society has available to work with the European Union. It is a popular misconception, however, that Europe is somehow immune to violation of uh, freedom of regional belief. Indeed, there are many European international instruments and mechanisms that grant this right. European countries offer great levels of freedom of religious belief, yet Europe is not exempt. Recent violations across Europe have been predominantly Islamophobic or uh, anti-Semitic in nature. But speakers yesterday have also shared several other examples. Finally, the abundant case law of the European Court of Human Rights have, uh, as, as we have heard uh, a few minutes ago, says it all. As European societies face new challenges as a, such as cultural and religious uh, diversity, <coughs> discrimination, it is vital that the European Union addresses religious intolerance and discrimination in a timely and relevant manner, both in its internal and external action. As I already stated at the beginning, as APRID, we are convinced that together we are stronger in defending and promoting freedom of religion or belief. The adoption of the EU guidelines on uh, freedom of religion or belief in June 2013 is a point in case. APRID, together with some befriended experts in this space, have been very much involved in drafting these guidelines. The guidelines represented at that time a significant step forward in institutionalizing the EU's recognition of this crucial, important human right. The guidelines help EU's officials and diplomatic representations across the globe to recognize violations and provide some suggestions as to how effectively we respond to these violations. As such, the guidelines were a significant improvement, but we're not there yet. This year marks the 10th anniversary of these guidelines, but we are st there are still many areas of improvement as reasons to celebrate. The guidelines need to be followed up by practical implementation and monitoring process. APRID particularly recommends that the, co that the call for training of EU officials on freedom of regional belief so that they can understand the cultural nuances and, uh, and, and what it means, actually, uh, this right in the life of many people. Several APRID members have already been involved in these training sessions in the past, and uh, we stand ready to support the EU and the External Action Service in the future in this and many other areas of collaboration. Another resource in uh, addressing freedom of religious belief is the European Commission Special Envoy for the promotion of freedom of religious belief outside of the European Union. The appointment of Jan Figel in 2016, the first ever mandate, and its renewal in 2017 were very welcomed. Resources, however, were not adequate and the institutional setup was far from ideal, being this mandate um, located outside the um, European External Action Service. Its, effecti its effectiveness was challenged Yet, we commend Jan Figel for the results he achieved and the passion he shown in carrying out his responsibilities. Unfortunately, at the end of Jan Figel's mandate in 2019, due to a number of circumstances, the position remained ineffective, if not vacant. Until the appointment of Franz Van Dele, who is a very experienced Belgian diplomat, of last December. 
Regretfully, much about his mandate is still unclear, meaning what resources he has, what, time, what, what team he has. But we trust that he will work as closely as possible with civil society organizations and uh, coordinate its work with the External Action Service and, and specifically with the EU Special Representative for Human Rights and his team. As with his predecessors, APRID is excited and looking forward to supporting the mandate. We also take note of the work of the European Parliament and its intergroup on freedom of religion or belief and religious tolerance. Within Parliament, freedom of religion or belief often seems to fall down the list of priorities ac across political group. Yet there are many members who are genuinely committed to this important right and we're grateful for their openness and willingness to uh, offer uh, a platform for, uh, for, for, for the discussion of this right. APRID has organized successful events in Parliament, looking at the intersectionality of freedom of religion and belief with other policy areas. For example, we hosted events on uh, freedom of religion and belief and trade, co-hosted the presentation of a report on uh, freedom of religion and belief and security uh, in partnership with the office of um, the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights and the office of the uh, vice president, uh, first vice president of the European Parliament. Further, APRID members have been involved on their own on many other events, uh, highlighting the situation in countries like Vietnam, Qatar, Iran, and many others. As I draw to a close, I would like to summarize some of the points uh, of, of my speech. Because of the importance of freedom of religion or belief, cooperation between different groups in defending and promoting it is crucial. By acting cohesively, organizations can form advocacy networks that are more effective as a whole than their separate units. In order to be able to work together, different groups, however, must learn about each other. Working together does not mean that we need to compromise our doctrines or our fundamental values or our beliefs or philosophies of life. In fact, some, I think that most of the constructive and productive moments in our meetings is when we disagree. Disagree, I feel, when, uh, when we disagree in a civil manner is an opportunity of growth. As Minister Sarmento and Castro said yesterday, only dialogue can promote a long-term effect in democratic societies. Secondly, cooperative organizations such as APRID multiply the opportunities for dialogue and exchange between diverse groups, augmenting their potential influence and their resources. Diverse organizations ensure that oppression is not a minority issue. Instead, raising awareness and creating impact for anyone who is involved and interest in promoting human rights. Effective advocacy and cooperation can influence policy and set international agendas which promote freedom of religion or belief as a fundamental human right. As part of this process of promoting this right, we appreciate invitations to participate in preparatory meetings, consultations, and other platforms within the European Union institutions and other multilateral organizations. Input from civil society organizations is an important and crucial aspect of European governance. And finally, we encourage the European Commission to equip the mandate of the Special Envoy for the promotion of freedom of religion or belief outside the EU with adequate resources, budget, and staff. In addition to acting within institutions, defending and promoting freedom of religion or belief is important in our relations with society. Popular support of human rights will be powerful in effective change because it strengthens civil society, which is the bedrock of human rights. As we work to advocate freedom of religion or belief in society, it becomes an integral part of that society, and the community itself will direct governments to religious protections. Ultimately, freedom of religion or belief requires a multifaceted approach from a diverse collection of individuals and organizations who are unified in their pursuit of human dignity. As we all work together within bureaucracies, governments, societies, our faith communities, and within our homes, we will become more effective in advancing human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Francesco Di Lillo. And now for the final remarks, I will ask Mr. Elder Joaquim Moreira from the Later Day Saints and the representative in the Interreligious Dialogue Working Group of Portugal the floor is yours. Uh, 
thank you so much for this invitation and to resume what we learned today and hear from so specialist and so important professors in, the, in these issues. But to, before I start, I, I desire to express as Paulo says in the, in the start of this meeting. When uh, yesterday evening I got my room, my, my home, and saw the news, I, I feel struck with the news and the, the journalists start uh, the prime time news in the television. The story of the rescue of the Turkey uh, disaster and uh, what's happened there. He start the news like this. Uh, we uh, like to share a word, hope, and don't talk about only the disaster of this mean. And he shares some examples of the rescue people uh, in that context. And the last one, it was a baby. And the mother died, and the baby survived. And what we talk about today and yesterday, it's about hope. And uh, we have hope. And thank you for this kind of approach, the human rights, the religion, uh, liberty, and uh, the free of speech. It's so important to us to understand and how much the religion is important in the society. The political scientist Samuel Huntington said that of all the elements that definition or define civilizations, the most important usually is religion. So it is not surprise that religious difference lays to the root of many conflicts in the world. But the solution is not let difference flourish not to stifle them. Studies show the protecting the varieties of religion the experience correlates strongly with the greater civil and politics liberties, greater press and economy freedoms, fear arms conflicts, better health outcomes, higher levels in incomes, better education for women, and higher overall human development, development. In short, religion's pluralism frees open room to live, to live life. Our disagreement on commenter road should not have to be pointed against each other in the battle of death. Diversity makes life harder, for sure, but also more worthy worthy living. Fears or differences often through threaten as more than actual differences. For have a conclusion for its uh, speaker before, Dr. Martinez so well done to talk about the rule of the law in the society. I understood this is important element. It's not all the solutions for resolve this kind of issues, but it's important to establish the frontiers for some issues as the speech of AIDS. And this is a, a huge concern, of course. The concern also the new form of inquisition. And have be careful to have be careful the language to offend people and to application in the law in the relationship with the feelings to have be careful between feeling feelings reputation and dignity and we we what well, what we could do about this complex situation. Attack or to attack ideas or attack people. Attack people who struck or 
affect the digni dignity of the people, of the person. And after talk about acts offensive to building sacred buildings and give the examples of Russia and Par Moscow and Paris. And the importance of the soci uh, soci civil society, the ethics we need to have in this approach, the rules on the involvement of the society, uh, civil society to the cultural respect of the people. And to combat the culture of bullying for a culture of respect. And thank you for the approach and the way you address in this case of so important topics. Dr. Salama, talk about the tension between the rights and himself and between the rights and human rights and the tension between the religions and human rights. And the law need to be a, a mean and not to his the, the, the highlight to resolve all things. But the application the way we live the religion and the human rights. And something so interesting, uh, listening, it's not natural. <laughs> it's true. And uh, we need to learn a process of learning and uh, talk also about the religion and conversion. And most important, the 18 commitments between faith and religion. Dr. Michael uh, Wiener talked about the example of Twitter and uh, the way of the hate speech spread in the social media. And the real uh, uh, cases normally don't go to, to the court. And Someone, someone or some way it's necessary to have a resolution for that. And also because we are in Portugal and he was so nice to quote <coughs> Jorge Sampaio and uh, some concerns he has in the past about a tool, a box for education and social media. And uh, um, education also be education, media, and immigration. And the way we need to uh, uh, deal with about the uh, hate of speech in the media. For finish, I enjoy uh, the words also of the Dr. Francisco. And to uh, conclude it, the importance of the freedom or religion or belief, cooperation between different groups in defending and promoting it is so crucial. The corporate organizations multiply the opportunities for dialogue and change between diverse groups, augmenting their potential influence in their resource. Diverse organizations ensure that oppression is not the minority issue, instead, raising awareness and creating impact for anyone interested in promoting human rights. In that, in that example of the organizations, I want to share um, experience I have in last week of January in the World Finance Forum in the last day, have a, a session to keep the faith, the importance of the religion and the economy in the world. And it's so important, and the moderator, when he invites four people to talk who represent different organizations, he asks only for them, don't talk about religion, but talk about the practice, the good practice of these organizations 
Of course, we are dealt with some religions, but could help the people in the world. And it is so important for Finnish to understand the important roles now the politics have in the economy or in, in, the, in the society, the importance of the religion is uh, now uh, be a priority or start to be a priority, not to use the specific word religion, but faith. Keep the faith. And uh, to resume that conference, the word also was hope. And I finished when I, I was start with this baby was saved. We need hope. And you are the hope we are discussed here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elder Joaquim Moreira. Now I believe we have more five, four, five more minutes for some question. I don't know if someone wants to address a question to some of our speakers. Anyone? No? Okay, if, if you don't have anyone to... Okay, we have one question. <laughs> I'd love to hear the panelists respond in respect to this undertaking. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I may say something very brief, um, I mean, it's something that has um, interestingly emerged in, in all of our intervention has been, uh, okay, law is important, and we have to come up with some much more than that. And I think the real challenge of our society is precisely that, and how to be imaginative <coughs> in this area, and to go beyond this culture of uh, um, this I'm obliged to do, this I'm not permitted to do. Uh, social life is much more than that. And until we realize that and we transmit that in, when I speak about education, I mean education in the broadest possible sense. I mean, it's education every time a Politician, I mentioned before that the mayor of Madrid is here. Uh, you may agree or disagree with uh, uh, his policies, but one thing he has, when he speaks, this person speaks in a moderate way, normally in a very respectful way, even for political adversaries. We need this kind of approach to things. It's, it's, it's the way we speak every time any person that speaks in public uh, open his or her mouth, he's transmitting much more than the content of the message. The tone of the message is very important. I, I would emphasize uh, the, the significance of not losing sight of that. And, um, I would add that we, I feel we tend to underestimate the wisdom at the grassroots levels. I've been impressed personally by seemingly very simple people or extremely sophisticated. And I think this is what is missing. I think there is a certain uh, intellectual arrogance uh, in general, including at the international level, and that the more the setting becomes peer-to-peer, -peer equal uh, exchange, and uh, all divine messages are based on stories. Stories are extremely powerful. One learns a lot uh, through the indirect ways and the experiences of others. It unleashes um, untapped wisdom. Uh, as compared to the top-down and the lecturing and the advocacy and the, and the preaching. Uh, this is missing, uh, including in the settings of this kind where experts are gathered, but much less people from the grassroots. And I think the COVID and, and IT taught us that there are invaluable and unlimited resources out there. Uh, my feeling personally, I hope I'm wrong, is that internationally at least we're going back to business as usual, uh, which is more travel and more top-down and... Uh, uh, more speeches and more standards, uh, rather than really uh, embracing. And, and uh, the second element is art. We're here in a place where art has its significance, it speaks to us. I mean, if, if God's language is silence, nature's language is colors and expressions and beauty uh, at large, we miss both. The silence in the sense of humbleness and listening to the others, our silence, not that of the others, and also the beauty that nature surrounds us with. Unless and until we bring this and this limit relates exactly to what you said, that law has its limits, and, and we, we remain within the same 
tiny place trying to do the same things and hope for different results. Thank you. That's actually a tough question. Right? <laughs> no, but I'd like to focus on praising the, uh, my, the, my co-panelists. After these days of listening about the relations between uh, freedom of religion and belief and freedom of expressions, I, I particularly enjoyed uh, your comments, Professor Turan. Uh, quite harsh, I mean, if, if one reads them uh, out cold when you, say, when, when you say that freedom of expression does not protect lies. Uh, well, no, no. What, what, when you say that does not pro that does not protect feelings, um, and uh, and uh, but then you also uh, pose the the question that uh, it does not protect lies. But how do we define lies? How how, how do we um, how do we uh, determine exactly when something, a statement, or uh, messages online are actual uh, lies or maybe fabrications or, or or anything? So that that makes it tough in uh, in assessing. Uh, in assessing case by cases. Uh, and I also wanted to praise the work of uh, Dr. Salama and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Biener and, uh, and, uh, and seeing the progress from, uh, from the uh, Rabat Plan of Action, when, uh, uh, which focused mainly on religious leaders and, uh, and hate speech and how it expanded through the Beirut Declaration and, uh, and the framework of the Faithful Rights into a more comprehensive uh, framework of uh, of human rights, which places religious leaders uh, at the core of um, of making sure that uh, these rights are uh, promoted and, uh, and and respected. I think I think that religious leaders do have an important and primary responsibilities vis-à-vis -vis their own uh, congregations, faithful mem and members, but also uh, with respect to uh, to the rest of the world in. Uh, in, uh, in sending positive messages that promote dialogues and mutual understanding. Okay, thank you for your question. Thank you again, thank you all. And now we are going to a break. I would like to thank Professor Nazila for her question because it made me realize that we should have had a, a panel like this more than just presentations. We'll do it like next time because the informality of what you have done right now was, was great. Sorry for not thinking about that before. We'll do it next time for sure. We are going to have a break now. We'll be back at 11 o'clock, if you don't mind. Enjoy your break.